Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to the series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through three Shadow Dark supplements. First is Solo Dark. This is developed by Kelsey herself, and it's a very short document, just 16 pages, for playing Shadow Dark solo. I don't usually do solo games. In fact, I've never really done... I've done a handful of solo games, and there's some pretty cool ones out there. Uh, but I thought this is a cool thing to review simply because there are some extra tables here for use. But for the most part, a lot of people are interested in solo games these days, and so I thought I might cover it. I don't think I'm going to do a lot of solo games on this channel. I, do, I don't have an interest in them myself too much, but this one is, I think, a bit different than the others because it's Shadow Dark, which tends to be my focus. So I thought I would go through it and let you guys know just you know kind of what it is. I'm sure many of you have seen it out there. It's free, so you can all pick it up. If you don't play solo games, there are some tables on here to get anyway, just for use at your own game. Uh, but if you do play solo games, maybe this one's of interest to you. So, Solo Dark is the first one I'm going to be covering. I'm going to be covering Letters from the Dark, Volume 6, which is Scallywags, which is about naval combat, uh, piratey stuff. There's a pirate hex crawl, uh, a couple of... Th uh, three dungeons, I think, that are... Yeah, three dungeons that are all um, connected and kind of piratey themed and all that stuff. So, it's a great supplement. I skipped Letters from the Dark, Volume 5. I've done one through uh, four before. I skipped five because I just don't have an interest in the content. It's the most expensive. It's ten dollars. It's just not my not my thing. But this one, I love pirate themed adventures. I've always wanted to do one. I mean, I did one uh, for a little while, but there's so much piratey stuff out there now for the OSR that I love, like Secrets of the Black Crag and uh, When Sea Is Calling, and and now Scallywags and uh, a few other supplements and adventures and things out there that I, I really like. So this is pushing me even more into doing a pirate themed adventure or pirate themed campaign. Then finally, I want to cover A Place That Was, Is, and Will Be, which is Sword and Sorceress Time Crawl, which is issue one, uh, which is sort of a, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a time crawl, a city crawl. It's a really, really cool idea. I love this one. I think I'm, I'm, if this is the first of a series of issues, I am very excited for the rest of these. So we'll come back to that one. Let's start with Solo Dark. Just really quickly go through it. It's only 16 pages, as I said. Um, classic art <laughs> from Shadow Dark, as you would expect throughout. Um, yeah, writing, design, and layout by Kelsey. So, you know, it's right in that, uh, right in the same vein as the rest. Basic rules for how to do it. You have a, an oracle. Uh, that's how you see if you um, succeed, right? Yes or no to the questions about the game world, and you get these unexpected answers and twists and things, how that work. Uh, the modified rules that you should play with, right? So group initiative and how that works for this one. Chaos mode, light, and luck. So you're playing it slightly differently than the standard Shadow Dark. How to get your prompts there. Uh, the characters you should make and how they how they begin two to four PCs, and uh, you get luck tokens. Right, uh, how to jump in? Just head right into a pre-written dungeon and use the oracle to help decide your characters' choices. Or you can create an entirely new adventure from scratch. Now, one of the things that this book does a lot is it basically just gives you resources or points you to resources that you could use for your own games. It doesn't have a whole long process for how to do solo games. It's it's very simple, very straightforward. Um, so it's not a very detailed document. You get like YouTube examples of how to do um, these these uh, planes, and of course these are all hyperlinked, so you can click on them and go right to the game that, that runs through it, solo games. You get some blogs on how to do solo gameplay, some podcasts for solo gameplay, and solo roleplay on Reddit, on uh, social media. Some good examples there. I need a monster. Okay, well here's some example. You can get Shadow Dark RPG monsters, the Monster Overhaul, uh, Index Card RPG, or Nave Second Edition. Those are the sort of monsters you're directed to. And the same thing with NPCs. You get some very interesting ones. Uh, but again, you get links to where you can get them yourself rather than giving you a whole bunch of stuff here. Right? This isn't so much a toolbox as it is like a... Hmm, how to put it? It's not a toolbox so much as an... as like an outline or something like that. Yeah, that's kind of how I think of it. Like a directory. Maybe is a better way of putting it than an outline. Treasure, encounters, dungeons, and wilderness, and what you can use to develop those things. Great art there. Love it. Love that one, too. Horrifying cultists. And this is where you get some tables, right? So some dungeon name tables. And that's kind of cool. A whole bunch of them. You can roll three times, and you get uh, three names. Vaults of the Insectoid Abomination, or Caverns of the Lightning Philosopher, or Stronghold of the Lost Ancestor. And then you get the Oracle and how that works. Um... Ask reasonable questions, plausibility, right? Defer to the game rules if there is a particular way. You don't need to ask the oracle if there's a system that the game has for solving that problem. 
Um, you need to phrase, ask your question with affirmative phrasing. Instead of asking, are there no orcs in this room, ask, are there orcs in this room? And then limit, ask no more than three questions per situation. So that's how that works. And then you have the, the results, how it works. Each time you ask the oracle a question, you must determine the odds and then make an oracle check. Before you make an oracle check, decide how likely your question is to get a yes result. Unlikely or impossible, you roll with disadvantage. Even, standard roll, and likely or certain advantage. That's simply it. No, twist, or yes. That's it, roll a d20, no twist or yes. And if you roll a twist, then you roll on the next prompt. This is some twist prompt that occurs here. So the verb and a noun, verb, noun. Uh, block, lead, or disagree, risk, <laughs> all right? Maybe you don't need all of them each, you don't need to roll for each of the prompts, but you certainly can. Um, if your oracle check is an odd number, excluding one, the outcome has a turnabout phrase. So it's but, so no but, twist, yes but. And then you roll. If you roll a natural one or a 20, it's the most extreme outcome. No, absolutely not. Critical fail. Yes, absolutely. Critical success. It's an interesting system, but it's very straightforward, and that's that's the whole thing. So I say it's 16 pages. It's actually only 13 with the front and back cover. So, you know, this is hardly a system. I mean, it is a system, but it's a very bare-bones system for solo games. I think there are other solo games out there that, that do this in a much more, you know, fleshed-out way. But... This certainly is sufficient to run solo games. Again, I, it's hard for me to judge solo games because I don't tend to have that much fun when I'm playing them. I don't tend to. I, I don't tend to play them. So um, I have a hard time seeing how, like, how useful this particular book is relative to other solo games. I've played a couple. I've played one solo game, which is a much more detailed than this, with much more complex systems, um, and it was very fun. But it required like journaling. It was like a storytelling game, basically, where you, at times, had a system for developing the story and you used cards instead of dice. It's a really interesting system. Um, it was different enough from standard play that it was a fun thing to do for a while. I wouldn't, it wouldn't be my go-to RPG. I, I don't know. If you, if you don't have a group to play with and you're like, I gotta, I gotta get my RPG fix, I think you could use this system to, to play in an RPG. And it would be pretty straightforward. Uh, and it would, it would work. A solo game. I'm not sure this is, if someone was like, I really want to play a solo game, I don't think I'd say, you should try Solo Dark. I'd probably be like, have you tried, you know, uh, Rangers of, what's it called? <laughs> I forget what that game's called. Or have you tried Strider Mode from uh, The One Ring? Which, again, I actually haven't looked into, so maybe that's just like this. Or have you tried, you know, just other solo games that are more specifically designed for solo play. But I think this is, a, it's free, right? So there's cool tables in here. It's a cool extra system to tack on. And if you are like, I really like Shadow Dark and I want to play it on my own, this is a great way to do it. The Oracle system is is totally solid and there's enough to it that it's not, it, you're going to get more interesting things than just you sitting there thinking up a story in your head. You're going to get more interesting variables, I think, because of the twist system and because of the odd but system. I like that. I think that would work really well for your own game. So check this out. And again, those tables are cool. I love tables. Prompt tables are, are great, especially if you're doing adventure design. And just use this as sort of adventure design tables rather than solo play tables. So solo dark, thumbs up, maybe one thumb up rather than two thumbs up. Uh, but a large portion of that is just simply because I don't play solo games. So I don't know, again, relative to other solo games out there, the I don't know the, 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 the value of the relative trade-off of the simplicity of this to the more complex systems you get with more dedicated solo games. All right, next is Letters from the Dark, Volume 6, Scallywags. This one's much bigger, 94 pages, and I, I, I really like this. I, I liked all of the Letters in the Dark um, that I have read through. Like I said, I skipped number five. It's just not my not my bag. I don't like that sort of stuff, that the, the, you know, the Hells and the Nine Hells. I've never really played that stuff, so it's not my interest. But I really do like Volume 6 um, so far. I, again, I just it's 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 right in the vein of the others. You get this really cool, you know, in-world funny uh, writing right away. You get a, a great table of contents. It's all hyperlinked, 90 pages. You can see what you're going to get. New rules with some classes and some ancestries. Rules for sponsors and rivals, which is really cool. The Plunder Dome, which is uh, the setting. You get Camber Isle, Marie Isle Island, uh, and the Typhon Isle. Three places with dungeons that are built in. Really, really cool. And then an NPC gallery with. I think this is the best part of the whole book, or at least I love this NPC gallery. Shadow Dark has very simple monsters. It's easy to develop your own. But one of the things that I really appreciated in 5e were those supplements that broke NPCs or NPC classes 
down into sections and developed a few options for them. That's what this does. Really cool. So you have commoner stat blocks, courtier stat blocks, criminal stat blocks that aren't just simply one, like just the, the criminal or the pirate or something. It's much more developed than that. You have more options. I love that. Great art as well throughout. Uh, new rules for seafaring and dungeon crawling. Stat, ship stats, wind rules, how to travel long distances or how to measure them on a six mile hex. Um, your crew and how that functions. How naval combat works. And I think this is a pretty cool way. Initiative. Ships don't have an initiative bonus. Characters can take actions on their ship's turn as long as enough crew members are manning the boat. That's basically how it works. You get attack ranges. You get how boarding rules work, repair works, and advanced tactics for your ships. Really cool, too. Uh, I've always wanted to recreate <laughs> at the table. I don't know how you would do it, but I've always wanted to re recreate the sort of Skies of Arcadia Legends naval combat rules where you set out a bunch of turns, turns in a row and then you try to, like adjust your your ship's movement to see if you can take advantage of broadsides and of, i've always thought that was really cool and i've wondered if there's been a way to do that i've never been able to develop a cool system for that but anyway this isn't that but it's a cool system for naval combat and it's very straightforward but i like it some ship stats clipper frigate galley uh, this is obviously higher and more more detailed ship stats than you're going to get in shattered Arc basic or in any of those books there were some shattered Arc, i think ship rules i think in the third curse scroll I just I seem to recall that. I might be totally off about that, but I know that some Vikings and things like that. There are some islands and island crawling. Um, so this is cool. You could combine that with this and have you know, long ships and have rules for that too. I think that's cool. Some sea monsters. The Kraken, a dragon turtle. Uh, the dragon turtle only has 30 hit points, which seems pretty low to me. Um, but... It has an adamantine shell, so it's immune to all attacks and spells except ship weapons, critical heads, plus three weapons, and fifth tier spells. So, yeah, it only has 30 hit points, which seems real low, um, but it's, you're not likely to kill it until you're very powerful. So, it's kind of like that. The same thing with the Kraken, um, or at least it has 30 hit points, which again seems really low. Uh, it's impervious to electricity damage. That's about it. I think 30 hit points is way too low for sea monsters. I'd probably boost those by quite a bit. Um, when you get to level 5th tier, 10th level, yeah, you can do a lot of damage, especially if you have a lot of, of NPCs or a lot of uh, hirelings. Or, you know, again, it, it, well, that's up to you how you want to run that. Some new weapons and some pretty cool ones. I think they're, they're great. You have the blunderbuss, the granado, the hand crossbow, muskets, nets, pistols, stink pots, and cartridges. Um, and you can reflavor other weapons to have a nautical theme, right? So the blackjack is a club or the boarding axe is a hand axe. The boarding pike is just a pike. Cat and nine tails, the cutlass, the harpoon, the rapier, and the trident. That's awesome. Some nautical backgrounds. Great. If you're going to do a campaign set at sea, the sharpshooter class. It's an interesting class. Um, has these, you know, ranged. You're using bows, guns, or thrown weapons as opposed to just straightforward attacks. You get three additional shots or slots that work with thrown or ammo. Um, reloading doesn't sacrifice your movement and... Uh, you get advantage on damage rolls for ranged attacks, which is pretty good. But I don't think any of that's game-breaking. I think it's just solid, good. You could use it instead of like a, a fighter if you want to be more ranged. Use this as sort of a fighter instead, and I think you'd have a lot of fun with it. Um, great art there. A swashbuckler. It's pretty fun. I like the maneuver. Three times per day on a successful weapon hit. Perform a fancy maneuver uh, against the target, such as disarming, shoving, tripping, or blinding them. The maneuver doesn't require any additional ro uh, rolls, but its effect and duration, typically one round, are subject to GM approval. What I would probably say is, um, instead of doing per day stuff, I always prefer having it go more in line with the Shadow Dark. Once you fail, you just don't get to do it again that day. That's more in line with the uh, style of Shadow Dark as opposed to having the sort of like reliable number of times per day stuff. That's not to say you couldn't do it, certainly, but that's more 5e where you can do something certain, no, things a certain number of times per day. Um, I like the Shadow Dark, do it until you fail idea. <laughs> and so I think I'd probably shift that over for Maneuver. I would just make it a check. Um, you know, you can do an extra check to do that successful maneuver. And if you succeed, you do it. If you fail it, then you can't try again until you rest or something like that. Or maybe just against that opponent if, if, if it's not, uh, you know, if it's not the kind of to your taste. Or maybe have a list of maneuvers and you could try each of them until you fail. Kind of like the Rangers, right? Something like that. Um, swashbuckler titles. <laughs> the level one is a strange one, a goody two-shoes. I don't know how that's a swashbuckler exactly. But the other ones are great. The ne'er-do-well, I love that one. That's one of my favorites. 
Um, so swashbuckler class. Sounds, it's, it's pretty solid, pretty good. I like it a lot, I like panache as well. And then you get some uh, merfolk and shark folk, as well as some names and uh, references, right? So the Greeks, uh, the, the merfolk relate to Atlantis, which is really cool, and the shark relate to the Makara, Makiri, M sorry, Makira, that's an island in uh, Melanesia. You get sponsors, rules for sponsors, the alignment for your sponsors, the missions they can do, stipulations, resources, and then some examples as, as well as random sponsors, missions, and stipulations. Rivals, rival adventuring parties, and how they progress. That's pretty cool if they want to do them. So what's the rival results? If you've right, dungeon has already been visited by rival crawlers, what happens there? New monsters, the dragon turtle, which is a much higher 77 hit points. Um, so I don't know what the 30 hit points was on the other one. Maybe it's I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it was a maybe it was a mistake. Maybe it hadn't been finished yet. Or maybe it was a lower kind of dragon turtle. I, I don't know. Um, you get goblin monkeys, <laughs> goblin sharks, or shark goblins, I should say. Hippocamp, Morlocks, Shark Folk, Troglodytes, Snalps. Cool. Great extra creatures. And then the Plunder Dome, which is a region. Cool island crawl here. Uh, how to travel through it, where the wind's coming from, sailing the isles, random encounters, winds, summaries of the region, backstories, stuff happening there. Factions that you can run into, and there's some great factions. There's the East Chulalan Tea Company, the Peachtree Brotherhood, the RNPF, the Royal Natural Philosophers Foundation. That's great. I love it. The Wave Guides, the White Widow, and Yoon Salvage Company. I love it. With the details of that uh, faction here. The White Widow is an awesome one. I like that one a lot. And the details of the islands and the dungeons that are there. You get cool dungeons with a lot going on here. I like this a lot. And again, this is the sort of thing I'm just... You take these three islands, add them into any other... Um, Archipelago campaign, the Swordfish Island campaign, uh, you know, Curse of uh, the, the Black, Curse of Black Cove, or whatever that one is. I always forget it. Uh, the name of that island hopping campaign. Just add this in, you get a whole bunch of great islands. Players can choose, and you put you know, information about it, and just have a, a great uh, hex crawl, an island crawl. And some cool stuff happening in here too with the Wumpus. <laughs> I love that. And then Typhon Isle, you get a Wave Temple, and. Uh, Cool little temple. I love that map. It's really, really cool. It appeals to me. I'm not really exactly sure why, but something about it's visually very, very pleasing. <laughs> Don't know. Really cool. The lighthouse with bad stuff happening up at the top. And uh, the baptistry, the altar. Aviary. Great piece of art there for an NPC. And then this is what I really love about this book. The NPC stat blocks. You get a whole bunch of NPC galleries. Um... If you want to modify them, you can make them demon or devils, ghosts, whatever you want to do there. But uh, here are each of the different NPCs that you can run into. Right? So commoners, uh, and you get a whole bunch of commoners. Like the merchant, the peasant, the prisoner, uh, the urchin. Instead of just having the peasant stat block, you get a whole bunch of stat blocks for commoners. All right? And I think that's really cool. And the same thing is true for courtiers. right? Instead of just having the spy or the noble, you get the jester, the executioner, and the royal guard, too. Instead of having criminals, just having the assassin, the thief, the bandit, the thug, be the arsonist, and the charlatan. So you, you know, there's a lot of extras coming from Shadow Dark, the base book, but there are others you get extra here. So instead of just the cultist, you get the cult leader, the entropist, and the thrall. The devotees, instead of just the acolyte and the high priest, you get the exorcist, the inquisitor. Now, the priest was here as well, but you get the paladin, the justiciar, and the monk. Entertainers, same thing here. Great ones. And some guards. Jailer, as opposed to just the regular guard or bodyguard or town watch. Mages, instead of just archmage and apprentice, you get the adept, the evoker, the necromancer, the witch. Naturalists, beastmaster, elemental, shifter, druid, explorer, ranger, slayer, hermit. Seafarers, instead of just pirates, you get the swabby, the sea captain, the cannoneer, the harpooner. Same thing with warriors, just really great stuff. I love this sort of thing. Really, really helpful. And then the, the you know, extra stuff at the end, as well as the next issue, which is Volume 7, which is Monster Mash. I'm really looking forward to this one. You get monstrous ancestries, lore and rules for beastmen, bugbears, gnolls, hobgoblins, lizard folk, lizard folk, orcs, and viparians. And then you get monstrous stories, six brand new adventures, which is awesome. Probably for those monstrous ancestries, I would imagine. And then NPCs, a whole bunch of extra NPCs, or at least a few. The bugbear hurler, uh, the gnoll, drimmermancer, and the bone shaman. So again, Letters from the Dark, Volume 6, Swashbucklers. Highly recommend, or Scallywags, excuse me. I highly recommend you guys check this out. Great work coming from Chris. Um, I, I think this is one of the best zines out there for Shadow Dark. In fact, it's, it's one of the best zines out there, in my opinion, period, just the series. So much useful stuff coming out. Um, so much great stuff you can add into your game. So I'll put links below to where you can get this one. Highly recommend it.
Finally, I want to check out this adventure, which is a place that was, is, and will be a sword and sorceress time sorcerish. I can't say that word. Sorcerish time crawl. This is such a cool idea. So basically, th this zine details a city that is, and then will be. Basically, it's a time hopping adventure. There's a portal that takes you ten days into the future after a disaster has occurred in the town. It's been ruined. And so you have the city and the stuff happening there, and then 10 days in the future, you have the ruins of those places and everything that's gone wrong. And so you can loot what will be and then come bring it back to the time or vice versa, right? You can take information from the time, change things, and then go into the future and take advantage of that. It's such a cool, cool idea. And uh, it's detailed really well. There's a lot of stuff going on in this, in this book. So I highly recommend you guys check it out. Um, the city of Narbasal, now in the present, it's a nascent city-state, and the city of Narbasal then, ten days from now. All goes wrong, everything bad. The city of the dead, a place that once was. Really cool. So, you get hired by this NPC, Muriel. She's She found her dead body in the future, and so she's like trying to use... It's, just, it's a fascinating character, and it's a fun character to be using in this game, but it's just a, it's just a great, great... Um, zine. I mean, this is issue one, as I mentioned, and if this is like the first in a series that detail this setting or this city, I, I would be very involved. I'm going to get the rest because this is super cool. Tons of resources in this book. You get an interesting map. It's a little harder to read until you kind of, I don't know, I think it could have been done a little bit more clearly or provided maybe a clear one, um, a clearer one could have been given, but this is totally fine and it's not bad at all. Um, you can totally function with it, especially when you get to the section at the end or towards the end where it details each of the, the wards of the city. Rumors that you get, tons of them, environments, the key locations now, and then you get them again in the future. Encounters aboard the, encounters aboard the wrecked warship, that's where the portal is. Um, there's a chronomancer there who's dying, and you can get through his, cro, his crolo lab, crolo lab, crolo lab. And uh, it's, it can, if it disintegrates, bad stuff happens. If you break it or if it breaks on its own, then crazy stuff can happen. Olox Library. Four mills, outer town on the mainland, treasure hunting then, right? So if you go into the future, how do you actually loot? And there are things that you can loot in each of the wards. There are tables for it. Uh, destruction that you wander through, encounters in the ruined city for each region, treasures in the city, key locations that you can run into, what's happening there. The trans-temporal fracture syndrome, right? So if you start to go back and forth through time, you start to go a little crazy, or maybe you get trapped in there, or maybe you age, whatever's happening. It's not... It's not good to go through the time for you, but it could be uh, could be could still be useful if you if you come through and nothing happens to you. You don't get sick. Whole bunch of appendices. This one has a, what's the timetable leading up to the place and in the future, each of the days from now. Uh, procedures and GM advice for exploring present day Narbasal. There's a few misspelling throughout the book. Not a big deal. Like procedures, here's a double R. Uh, just little things that can be fixed and will be fixed, I'm sure, in future updates. But it's it's great. So procedures you get, I, I like them quite a bit. Um, again, more ex advice for the future. And then the wards, breaking down of the wards now and the different b brief descriptions of them. I think it's pretty cool. Uh, and then taverns, the, cr the raft, Mark, Rasha Shack, the Bylam Bell Tower, the Gnaw, Vat Pavilion, Kasim, Running Crab, <laughs> the taverns of Narbasal how it works there. The Troubled Brewing Table, Narbasalian Cuisine, Narbasalian Backgrounds, if you want to run a place from here, and some new monsters for this particular place and NPCs. Great stat blocks, straightforward, really creepy, great pieces of art um, for the most part. Some of them are a little washed out, um, but that's fine. And then in 1E stat blocks, so if you want to play this not in Shadow Dark, but in, you know, oh, the first edition, <laughs> uh, you can definitely do that too. Um, old, school, old school rules. Um, yeah, and then you get the Pink Pony of Death, which is the, uh, or this is the, the, the company, Pink Pony of Death, and their, their back cover or their alternate cover. So I think this is a great adventure, the place that was, is, and will be. Again, if this is just the first issue in a series about this place, I'm totally in. Even if it's just, you know, a sign of the kinds of products that uh, Pink Pony of Death is going to be putting out, very happy with it. I think it's awesome, and I, I just take tons of ideas for this. I love these sorts of outside-the-box adventures, especially ones that deal with big locations like ruined cities or things of the future. I love that. I've, I've been putting one of my campaigns a while back, West Marches I ran, 
dealt with an old ancient ruined city and players could go through the whole thing and go down into bits of it and you know go up into the old spires and different places and it just felt really cool it was a different kind of dungeon big mega dungeon environment i love those sorts of things rather than you know and you can certainly have procedures for searching through it i would probably develop particular locations and detail them much more make dungeons in these places rather than just kind of have a few named locations and then the overall procedure for the place but make some really cool dungeons that they can go to. And, and if you could create some cool interactions between the past and the future in those in environments, that would be awesome. Okay, well, anyway, a place that was, is, and will be. I'll put links below to where you can get that. Uh, we also looked at Scallywags and Solo Dark. So I'll put links below to where you can get all of this. I hope this has been an interesting one, guys, and I'll see you all in another video.